Hello, and here we are live again. Uh, welcome Europe and Africa. Welcome all the guests that we have. Um, today I'm joined by two wonderful guests. John Krakauer, who's a really big thinker about what neuroscience and behavior can give us and how they relate to one another and so forth. And Athena Akrami is like just a fantastic uh, physiologist and, and a core member of Neuromatch Academy. I want to start today with a little bit of bragging because my t-shirt just arrived. Look, I got a Neo Magic Academy t-shirt. And can you read what it says on the back? Mm, what a I lovely t-shirt to today. It says, uh, <laughs> it won't be much work. I don't know who would say such a thing, but apparently it is a thing to say that. In any case, I'm delighted to be talking with you today on base day, which is the day for which I was the day chief and the day uh, that... Uh, that I worked a lot on, and uh, and 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 uh, Bayesian statistics is an idea that like is really close to my heart, but I think it's often overinterpreted, and that's why it's so great to have like two speakers who can give meaningful, uh, meaningful context for that. So why don't you introduce yourselves, um, uh, John? Who who are you? Give us a little who, are you, who how you get here. I think I, I think got, got here because, because I'm a friend, friend of yours, of yours. <laughs> and you're looking you're forward, forward to me, to me making, making a fool, fool of myself. myself. Um, um, so, so um, my name's my John Krakauer. Krakauer. I'm a professor, I'm a professor of neurology, neurology and neuroscience, and neuroscience. Uh, uh, Johns Hopkins. And, and I'm, I'm interested, interested in, in, oh my oh gosh, gosh. Um, um, uh, brain, brain plasticity, recovery. I'm very interested in theories of skill, learning, and motor control. I'm very, I'm very interested in the interested cognitive, cognitive motor interface, interface and the, and the sort of links between them. them. And I'm very much interested in how notions of complexity and the philosophy of science can interact with uh, neuroscience to ultimately, can we have a cogent theory of mind? That's it. Great, what about you, Athena? Hi everyone. Um, sorry, I keep repeating uh, appearing here, so I promise to disappear for for a long time after after this Q and A session. So uh, um, some of you already know I am a neuroscientist at Science Bay Welcome Center in uh, University College London, and uh, we study various aspects of learning, memory, inference. In particularly related to today's subject, um, we care about. Uh, how animals or, or human um, uh, learn from their experiences in order to update their prior knowledge and in order to, in a kind of more context of statistical learning and unsupervised learning, we learn about the structures in the environment and this structure sometimes has some statistical properties. And sometimes we can kind of, uh, one way to look at that is like, uh, different sensory experiences might have different prior uh, probabilities. So how we can learn that and how we can update that. But I'm so afraid to be here in front of John because probably he's going to criticize me and my approach in the lab to put the animal in the box, artificial box, and measure the behavior and their, their neurons. So I'm really, yeah, I'm scared to be here. <laughs> I don't think there's any reason at all to be scared, Athena, quite, quite honestly. <laughs> so, but, so, so there will be different questions that we will answer today. There will be some questions that are related to details of the tutorials that we had today. And then there will be some questions related to like the big picture question. I will do my best to first talk about the big picture questions, because basically, if you're unclear about how to interpret Bayesian statistics and what it can do for us and so forth. This is much more problematic than if there's something in the mathematics of that. Like that is something that is easy enough to fix. So I think we should start with that. And in fact, like I will, I will start with the questions that go into that situation. So here's a question. Uh, oh, and I should say I will also today purposefully we only invited two people. Uh, which is John and Athena, because we want to see to which level we can get people to ask their own questions. So, well, as we go through it, ask people to come on stage to ask their own question, uh, questions. 
uh, that will not always work. No? Like sometimes internet is too slow. Sometimes you don't want to go on online. If I ask you, do you don't want to come online? Just don't come online. And like I will eventually ask the question on on your behalf. And um, uh, and otherwise, um, yeah. So so this is it's the first time and it's already working. Cedric, what is your question? Um, um, my question, my question is. is uh, institution where the brain does not actually control to these these components. Our vision of appropriate to understand brain and it's not what what are the alternatives? Yeah. So 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 that's that's a that's a good point. So so uh, Cedric's question. We had some audio issues. Is uh, is in a way that uh, that when the brain isn't quite base optimal to which level are base uh, Bayesian approach is still appropriate to understand brain so functions mm -hmm. and uh, and so maybe we should uh, john what uh, what what would be your take for that oh john can't hear us okay then uh, uh, then uh, maybe maybe we should uh, we should ask athena first so athena um, we never quite are in situations where behavior is quite optimal from a Bayesian way. To which level would you say that Bayesian approaches are still useful? First of all, maybe we should know that like Bayesian, Bayesian approach, approach is a very, is a very uh, kind of a kind generic, of generic big, big uh, framework, framework, right? 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 And, and uh, 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 it can it be can applied be in various, various levels, levels and various, various kind of, kind of uh, uh, contexts. Context. Like even, and if, even the if the brain at the level of behavior of the organism, of the organism is, not is not based optimal, optimal still, still maybe, maybe when, when we are dealing, dealing with some data from that uh, that brain, uh, 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 we might use Bayesian Bayesian framework in the sense of like I mean it's it's I mean for model comparison right it's it's just a tool so it depends that how we are using that that tool uh, for for data analysis for model comparison we can still uh, use use Bayesian definitely. But on the other hand, if you're talking about the behavior and whether the, the behavior uh, or the decision of the, of the animal is Bayesian optimal or not, I think it's still, it, is, it can give us interesting insights about how exactly is not Bayesian optimal. Because sometimes it's about how we are defining the, do we have the access to the right prior that the, 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 the subject is using? Or like, do we have access to the cost function that the animal is using? And due to various constraints, evolutionary constraints, ecological constraints, these might put kind of a, a more additional um, constraint on, the, on, a, on a, beige, a Bayesian agent, basically. And I think it is still it can be insightful to understand in what ways that Bayesian optimal model that we had in mind is failing to explain the, the, the behavior. We are still, I think we don't have John. Yeah, well, John just came back. So John, okay. Uh, okay. Cedric's question very nicely got at how we should think about Bayesianism, because in a way, uh, no, like in Cedric, correct me if I, like, if I, if I misrepresent you here. Um, if behavior isn't optimal, how how is Bayesianism still useful? I think John doesn't hear us. Um, uh, yeah, he doesn't. Um, okay, let's let's see here. Um, uh, yeah, so 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 let's maybe let me let me see if I can structure that a little bit. So, um, if behavior isn't optimal. Why is Bayesianism not useless? So, so if the idea, look, let, let's, let's boil down Bayesianism of what it's about. Bayesianism says if we are uncertain about things, we need to rely more on the things that are more certain. That's in a way, like at least for Q combinations, the essence what, of what it's about. And that generic idea that we should rely on the things that are more useful is of course a generic maxine. No, like 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 that's it, it. It's we should expect people to be good at those things, 
and uh, let me see if I can get John back on screen. So what that means is now we have a model where I can I can make a prediction. Now the prediction will not be perfect and Cedric I think that that's very important like the prediction will not be perfect but the prediction will go into the right direction and that's something that like that Bayesianism clearly can do for us that it makes predictions that go into the right direction and um, uh, and uh, and then the question is, does it need to be optimal? No, like there's like there's other factors. You no, know? like physiology is real. Um, uh, there are other psychological factors. But then also, as Athena said before, there are many other. There, there could be constraints that we don't know. There could be other uh, other objectives of the systems that we don't know. So in a way, it could be that it doesn't look like we're quite Bayesian, even if the brain was Bayesian, because we don't have a complete model of the world. But it could also be that um, uh, that uh, that there are non-Bayesian factors that are important, and of course there are. Now, like the question is, uh, can Bayesian idea explain relevant variance? Does that roughly explain your question, Cedric? Yes, very much. Yes, very much. I'm sorry, there is a name. I'm sorry, there is a name. So it's just add. We just add one or two things. Uh, one or two things, but uh, I'm going to uh, cut my sound. Oh, now it's better. Something. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. No, Conrad, you uh, definitely got at the heart of the issue. Maybe just uh, one or two things I would add to this is I think that definitely one of the major advances, uh, thanks to the Asian way of thinking about this, is <clears throat> the um, the need to to represent uncertainty and somehow take into account uncertainty, and that has for me it's, at this point it's pretty much um, we pretty much all agree on this. Now, to what extent can uh, the Bayesian approach still help us uh, understand more? Because now we are at, in many situations, uh, like you said, the predictions are not actually close to, to Bayesian uh, performance. And if you're still looking at it through the Bayesian lens, there, there can be many ways, uh, uh, the way, uh, for, uh, the many reasons why we deviate from optimality, right? It's not the right prior, not the right model. Maybe we don't understand the cost function, the constraints. So is the Bayesian framework still useful to think about, you know, all the, the computation that the brain needs to do, even as you know, a computational level kind of framework. Yeah, sorry if I made this longer. Yeah, so so let's see, John, can you hear us now? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, cool. Uh, what what are, what are your thoughts? I, I sort of um, caught it halfway through. Um, I mean. For me, I mean, just so you to be very honest, you know, when we dabbled with um, sort of Bayesian framing of questions, as you know, Conrad, we used it sort of in the classical way, not Q integration, but we used a sort of Kalman framework to look at learning rates in the setting of sensory motor and state uncertainty. And we found exactly like we, we just heard that sometimes its predictions were turned out to be true and other times they didn't work at all. So then it raises the question, well, what does one do? And sometimes you seem to be Bayesian and other times you don't seem to be. And I think it's absolutely true that there's a tendency to avoid much discussion of the sort of anti-Bayesian or failure to be predicted by a Bayesian framework. And we just didn't know quite what to do with those data. Um, but it left me unclear what one should do. And then it, what one does is one falls back on what I also think I heard, which is if you believe uncertainty is important, which is a kind of close to a banality, right? Um, then you can couch almost every single cognitive process or sensory motor process in those terms. So you basically strive for universality. And then what happens is you say, well, the Bayesian framework is the best one to talk about uncertainty in every cognitive sensory and motor process that we can study. It gives us a, a formalism. It gives us a way to couch our hypotheses. 
And then we have to decide whether we care, whether sometimes the prediction is right and sometimes conforms, I should say, with the prediction and other times it doesn't. Right. And um, we can get on to that a little bit later. But I think we have to decide between whether we think this is a mathematically useful formalism. Two, is it the best way to bring uncertainty into our hypotheses and experiments? But then we have to ask, well, what happens when sometimes we're Bayesian and sometimes we're not? What's going to break the tie conceptually? Yeah. And I, and I mean, like, this is the thing that I think everyone using these techniques needs to be aware of. No, like there exists a clear large, uh, clearly a large number of phenomena that where there's base like behavior where uncertainty matters. But, but just because there are doesn't mean that everything is all of a sudden Bayesian. No, like it's, 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 it's more like it's part of the set of models that, that seem very successful at explaining things. But lots of phenomena don't even have like very clearly defined uncertainty. So, so, so I think we want to be more uh, precise. Cedric, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and let's go to the further questions. Now, I think I figured out where some of the uh, where some of the uh, the the echoes coming from. So, so Crowdcast switched to this thing called Studio Sound. I found that when I click it so that it's off, so that the icon is red, that I get much better sound without uh, without echo. And why this is the case, I don't know. But like these guys are like innovating maybe overly quickly. So uh, in any case, uh, it's uh, but 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 these are the right questions to discuss. So um, so thanks, Cedric. So let's look uh, here. Um, uh, I have a question from Joel. We've been flirting with the Bayesian brain idea today, but I was wondering, can you talk about it more? For example, is the brain really a Bayesian inference machine? And what does predictive coding in the free energy principle tell us uh, uh, about all this? And I'm supposed to ask it. And uh, and uh, why don't we uh, why don't we start with Athena this time? Okay, Athena's muted at the moment. Let me unmute her. Okay, Athena, now we can hear you. Yes, now we hear you. Yeah, okay. So uh, let me look at the question again because at the start, yeah, it, uh, I think there are, we can definitely spend hours talking about predictive coding, about free energy, about, about Bayesian inference separately. And I think all of these are basically kind of frameworks that from this framework, we should produce some testable hypotheses and then ask the right question in, in, that, in that framework. framework. Yeah, predictive coding says that uh, maybe the purpose of our uh, nervous system is in order, in order to be able to predict the future uh, state of the world. And in order to uh, always kind of, you know, I mean, we, we would like to know what happens uh, either in terms of sensory experiences, motor movement, and, and then we can have different ways of, of being able to do the, uh, to implement that predictive coding. Maybe one of them is through. Uh... Okay, um, it looks like Athena's stream just froze. Uh, we we really need to 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 move on with different uh, with different uh, uh, with different uh, uh, alternatives to Crowdcast. But um, uh, but the quite uh, but uh, but I think that that uh, that here Joel's point is extremely important. So um, it's possible. Uh, no, like we've we've shown that, like as as uh, John said, trivially uncertainty matters. There are cases where we are uncertain about one thing, and then we rely a lot more on the other things. Okay, so, so this is the part that we can all agree on. The question is, what now that exactly means? Now, like, and you can say it might mean one thing. Which it clearly does, which is the normative one, where I can, or the 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 Y model, where I can say. I expect people on average to obey kind of the 
the, the rough direction of effects that we have in Bayesian models. And like, if you're more uncertain about something, you rely less on it. Like, sure, yes, we strongly should expect that to be the case. But um, does that now mean that the brain is kind of made out of like little Bayesian computations? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It could very well be that the brain just learns. And like any learning system, and this is something that's usually not appreciated, any learning system will approximate Bayesian learning because, uh, because ultimately uh, the Bayesian solution is the best if you want to get like low variance estimates of that. No? So, so in that sense, the, the, the fact that, um, that uh, we get... Um, that Bayesian models on average are kind of good. It's not surprising. It's like the right solution to the problem. The question is, can we now say that therefore the brain is built on Bayesian principles? And I don't think we can do that. I don't think we're entitled to say that. And Athena, you like froze halfway through your explanation. Do you want to go back to where you were? I, I got frozen. So I, I, I was talking about the, the predict, predictive uh, uh, coding uh, framework that like, um, um, so it, it's important, a lot of people can, from the normative um, uh, perspective, argue that uh, we, a nervous system um, needs to be predictive about the future state of the world. And especially in the, in the environment that there are a lot of, maybe things are noisy, things can be, uh, but at the same time, there is a kind of a structure that we need to exploit that structure, right? And, and if we learn that structure, we can predict it well and we can then in the in the in ambiguous situations, in noisy situation, we can denoise and disambiguate that based on our prediction. And I think um, in that regard, one way to uh, um, implement um, uh, uh, predictive coding is through maybe Bayesian Bayesian uh, inference, right? That we we build a prior that prior has some um, 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 good information about the structure of the world, and and we use that in different in different context. Uh, but as you said, I think the most important aspect of, of, of Bayesian inference is the use of the uncertainty that um, uh, can be very important for a lot of agents in, in terms of uh, learning from our decisions, basically, right? If, if you just like make a decision and we don't know about the, uh, we really don't know about the uncertainty around the decision, we cannot learn from our decisions, basically, for future, future actions. And uh, um, Bayesian, Bayesian inference is a good, is a is a beautiful um, um, framework to to uh, use that uncertainty. Great, and I, I want to briefly answer a follow up question by Samuel Picarte. He asks, "Is Conrad saying that it's possible to get to a Bayesian solution without performing Bayesian operations? Should we provide an algorithm that does it? Like, yes, if you have a neural network that does gradient descent, it will absolutely one hundred percent produce Bayesian computations." If I remember it right, there's a nice paper by Wei Di Ma doing exactly yes. that. So, like, yes, absolutely. No, that's the thing. You don't need Bayesian microcomputations so that behavior is ultimately Bayesian. And thanks so much, Luciano, for, for joining us here. What's your question? Uh, Echo, do you hear me? No, we hear you great. Okay, good, thanks. So I'm asking this question in the context of um, yesterday's, I think, outro, well, Friday's outro video, where we, we could see that uh, the manifold, like the connectivity and the architecture sort of limits or makes it easier for the network to learn certain things as opposed to other, other behaviors. So with that in mind, can we, can we guess or maybe broadly describe the architecture of a brain circuit that can implement Bayesian updates or Bayesian decisions? Uh, Athena, do you want to take that question? It sounds <laughs> like right in your, mean, in your area. Right, exactly. And that's actually a kind of an uh, ongoing uh, research line in the lab, right? And, and, and I don't think we have any kind of a, a, a fully explanation for that. But there are very interesting insights uh, from, uh, like, uh, so you can look at the, um, uh, when we could talk about probabilistic computation, 
uh, and use of the pro uh, probability distributions, there are different thoughts about how neurons can represent that distribution. One way might be we just like um, uh, represent some summary statistics of that distribution, like mean and the variance of the, of, the, of the distribution, right? Or we can just like represent the whole distribution you, by using the, uh, like a, a sampling, right? Sampling of the, of the, of the, of the distribution. And um, um, uh, some people like um, Alex Pouget, Peter Latham, they proposed a, 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 a population dynamic computations that would allow you to represent these probability distributions and combine them. And they showed that in, in, in tasks very similar to the, to the um, uh, Q combination task that Conrad was, was telling you about in the tutorial, that uh, when you have two different sensory <laughs> stream and each has, has, can have a mean and a, a variance around that. So you can show that if, if then um, neural responses uh, behave as if like the, the combination of these two sensory inputs have a squish, like uh, a narrower um, 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 variance because, and that basically fits this um, uh, uh, notion of, of Bayesian inference uh, in, um, uh, that underlies this Q combination. And there are other uh, theories like uh, Matthew Lingiel has very interesting theories about how a neural network can implement sampling based um, 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 inference. And there are, and based on their model, so they have a, basically a neural network model that implements that. And the interesting thing is that then they, they are able to have some predictions about the neural signatures of that, of that model. How should, how, what should we look for in the, in the neurons in order to see whether that specific neural activity um, uh, um, is compatible with a, with, a, with a computation that uses sampling in, um, 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 uh, inference. And they also, there is a paper that shows that like for instance, V1 activity is in accordance with that sampling based inference. And there are other, other um, 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 theories as well various labs, including my lab, we try to uh, look for those neural signatures that come out of the prediction based on uh, any of these ways to estimate a probability distribution. Great, and uh, but, but to, to just add my worry about it, you know, like, and, and I, I think it's important for us to communicate the worries that we have. Um, yes, behavior in many cases is roughly Bayesian, but let's summarize what that literature is. Every single experiment that I'm aware of looks at the kind of task that you do a million times a day. Now, if you have a task, or let's say thousands of times a day, a million times in your life, now like, that means that there could be lots of ways of, of getting at a solution that kind of does the right things. And as Athena said, like, yeah, maybe there's sampling and maybe there's pop, uh, probabilistic population codes and so forth. But that the space of possible models that does it is of course much, much bigger than even those that humans can come up with. You know, like evolution is, is experimenting in kind of a big space and on top of it, we have lines. So, so, so I think we want to be very careful about how to interpret it. I totally agree, yeah. So can I say, can I just say a few things about this, Conrad? Yeah, sure. I mean, I find, you know, this is where I'm glad you invited me because this is where I get kind of irritated, right? So, in other words, what's so frustrating about this is you, it's such a slippery area, right? On the one hand, um, you can use this as, you know, a way of talking about, as we discussed, the general notion of internal models and doing it in a probabilistic language when it comes to Bayesian approaches. And then you go, okay. Right. And it's interesting that where there seems to be sort of traction is when we've already got notions of sensory and motor and we can talk about proprioception and vision and we can talk about Q integration. We can talk about learning rates. And so what it always seems to me is there's a gradient of, of decreasing plausibility from where we can couch our Bayesian hypotheses and use real data and algorithmic ideas. And then we get traction. Q integration, things like that. When we start getting cognitive and just talk about the general problem of doing inductive inference, where suddenly every single co cognitive operation from planning to thinking 
all of it comes under the notion almost, with the exception of deduction, we come into inductive inference. Everything is game for this framework. Okay? And then the, the, you get, it gets confusing because there's no psychological or algorithmic intermediate concept. So you have this normative computational framework minus any psychological algorithmic claim or how you're going to get those priors, how are you going to get the cost function, how are you going to get the likelihood computation, how do you have, where does that generative model come from and what form does it take? And because of that, one degenerates into abstraction at the computational level, which I'm all for, to frame questions and to design experiments and to go on to test. But then going looking in the brain for actual probability distributions when it comes to these more cognitive operations, minus any intermediate psychological concept, is, in my view, it just doesn't enlighten me at all. So, right? so and the what reason why it's worked, you know, it's, 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 there's, there's something missing and it's called psychology. <laughs> uh, yeah, but what about uh, what about the fact that say there is a broad range of phenomena that where we can predict behavior relatively well using Bayesian ideas? You no, know, like like the the, the you no know, the question is where do we delineate where the field is actually doing a lot of good because they're correct and psychology has been adopting a lot of Bayesian ideas and where do we feel is like overstepping its boundaries? Well, I mean, things like, let's take free energy, which somebody asked about that, right? I mean, if you look at Bayesian brain, and you could argue that free energy is a kind of algorithmic way of actually instantiating Bayesian brain, right? And then predictive coding is some extra sort of set of assumptions that you then make to get predictive coding. Right. But the problem to me is I have no problem if it's a way to sort of formulate normatively to start designing experiments. But if you take the free energy principle, as far as I'm concerned, and I've listened and read Carl Friston a lot, is what he's come up with is an adaptive homeostatic mechanism couched in Bayesian principles with some dynamical systems thrown in and some information theoretic ideas. You make this salad and you end up with a principle that is so generic, so coarse grained, that it applies as much to a cell in a dish as it does to a human brain. So in other words, it may be so true that it actually fails to come up with any principles that distinguish a cell from a brain, which it doesn't. And I've actually heard Carl Friston um, say, well, that's a little bit like the Sorites paradox, right? Which is, when do a number of grains become a pile of sand? And at some point, a cell, through some continuous mysterious process, becomes a brain based on the same overall principle. And the problem is, is that so generic, so abstract, that it's of no use whatsoever. It's vacuous. Right? And, we get, and, we get, and we get perilously close to a string theory for the brain, where no experiment actually suggests itself, right? So I find that it's a nice way to sort of, sort of have sort of mathematical masturbation, but unless there's some kind of psychological, conceptual, algorithmic consequences that we can actually test, I don't quite know what we're doing. Otherwise, unless we just want to be up on our trapeze high in the troposphere, talking in such generic language, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so, so, so hold on, let's, let's, let's distinguish two different things. Um, there is the Bayesian behavior hypothesis, you know, like which is, there is a lot of behaviors where you rely more on the less noisy data. And then there's the Bayesian brain hypothesis that says that basically once you understand Bayes' rule, you understand the, the brain. Like, I mean, it's absurd. 
like and and, and, and let me say where, where I stand and yeah. I published a number of papers yeah, and I, was... I am kind of a Bayesian behavior person I'm not a Bayesian brain pass. Now, there's one more thing that Bayesian statistics can, of course, do for you. you know, it can point out which variables are important. And in that regard, kind of arguably, it's 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 useful. Now, like it tells us like, hey, if we look at behavior, we should like think about like to which level there's meaningful uncertainty in the maybe sensory information or information we have about the environment. So, John, you disagree with the brain, Bayesian brain thing. Uh, how do you feel about like that I, middle? I don't, I don't disagree with it. I mean, obviously, I, I you know, it's so interesting, right? These deep subterranean connections, you know, this discussion about the world is full of ambiguous and sparse data, and we have to bring to bear some kind of inductive bias or prior that is given to us by evolution or by learning, you know, and that they have to combine in some principled way you know, you have the same argument going on with deep neural nets that you need to have inductive biases. You know, you had Chomsky come along and say that you had to have some generative grammar prior in order to learn language because you never got enough samples. I mean, this keeps coming up over and over and over and over again, right? And the, and the question is, is we all agree that you have to have some internal representation with expectations that combine with what is inadequate from the outside right? Then you have to decide whether Bayes is the best way to have that conversation because it has the proper formalisms required to have that conversation. And then you have to ask, is it a good way to start normatively? Because you can then descend the Marian ladder and start to come up with experiments to put sort of algorithmic and implementational flesh on that way of thinking. Now, I'm not against any of that. But until we actually do the work beyond the initial formalism to the idea that people have had for a very long time, I just haven't seen as much progress as people think they have because they've been focusing more on the formalism than they have on the psychological flesh that it also requires. Do you see? So I'm not against or for. I just think that it's overrated at the moment we, we are not talking about uh, oh, Athena no I just want to say that I totally agree with you that uh, there is a lot work left to do but I don't think we are hopeless and I don't think that and, and, and actually I mean that's basically basically my motivation to 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 do what we are doing in the lab to may, maybe he, kind of contribute helping that uh, filling that gap that as you said we do have this uh, generic framework starting from the very high level computational principles that yes the word is structured is is, is sparse and uh the, the animal needs to build some s sort of internal model and and take into account uncertainty and maybe bayesian framework is the right way to to learn in this sparse uncertain environment and how does that work how does that really reflect in the brain I agree. We really don't know, but um, and I think that's that's the exciting part somehow. I mean, I mean that's why I, I think that if 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 we didn't have that, I mean, if we already know that, then we would be. I mean, I don't know. I, that that's one of the reasons that neuroscience is such a young field. And and uh, um, I would like to hear your point first. Why do you think it's hopeless to um, uh, to hope that? Um, we will, we, will, we will basically find that uh, conceptual psychological level bridging that high level computation to, to real brain. And second, um, what is, do you have a better alternative right now? Is that for me or anyone yeah. else? I mean, I, yeah. I, again, I'm not, I, I, it's hard to describe. I'm not saying that it may not be the formalism within which to begin to couch hypotheses and design experiments, you know, with respect to a notion that you have built in priors and you can update them and, and that you, I mean, all of that's fine. It's just that it doesn't necessarily do a lot of, for me, I want to know about things like working memory and attention and motor cortex. And I want to know about learning. I mean, I want, those intermediate objects. And all I'm saying 
is that it's not obvious to me, and I mean this non-polemically, that one will necessarily find those intermediate algorithmic and implementational objects better by looking through a Bayesian framework. Now, I actually think sometimes it does, right? There's lovely work by, you know, uh, Sam Gershman and, you know, Dieter Conrad's had, Josh Tenenbaum, where they, it seems to me they do show where it may be useful to have a Bayesian framework to look at more concrete things. But if we stay up in the Fristonian trapeze, I just don't, and predictive coding, I just don't see that kind of traction in the same way. I agree. Can I add one more, uh, maybe just the kind of a personal um, 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 perspective into this, that I came to this point exactly because I started uh, studying working memory. And, and through a studying of working memory, it kind of uh, very quickly um, uh, uh, struck me that like working memory is not just like a pure holding into some sensory representation. Working memory immediately becomes integrated with our previous knowledge. And working memory, like for instance, in the uh, uh, one thing that um, um, we, we found during my postdoc work was that uh, uh, how working memory um, is impacted by prior, sens uh, prior sensory experience, as if like described by um, Hollingworth 100 years ago in the concept of, of uh, contraction bias. Right, that we we try to hold on into some some memory of some some um, some items, and this memory becomes kind of shifts or drifts toward mean of the distribution of all all the stimuli that that we hear. Right, so there is a very intimate uh, intimate relationship between these the other components that you mentioned are very important for our cognition, and uh, maybe this this gener a more generic framework of of our behavior always tends to. Uh, 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 use um, our previous knowledge in a Bayesian uh, in a Bayesian way. So, and I think then maybe, and I use that as a kind of a segue in order to to understand better working memory. If we maybe look at that through the framework of of, of Bayesian inference, uh, right? And that's where the rubber hits the road. I agree with you entirely that if that framework helps you revise learn more about working memory that's wonderful but it's you know it's interesting that when you know conrad sort of cops out by saying that he's a behavioral bayesian person but not a brain bayesian person it's actually a very deep point that he's making <laughs> surprisingly which is that some it's, it's always confusing to me whether when you set up your probabilistic calculus for a task and ask if someone's Bayesian, I can never decide whether what you're doing is purely talking in the environmental task space and how well is one representing that or whether those terms in the Bayes equation, rather than being about the structure of the world, you know, if there's a cloud in the sky, is it going to rain? And how often does it rain? How often are there clouds? And can you actually model that, right? Versus whether the terms in the equation actually relate to psychological processes and representations, right? And so it seems to me that when Conrad, I'd like to see what he has to say, when he makes his statement, it almost seems as though one can have this dualistic view of the terms of the Bayesian approach, where there are the terms about the structure of the world and do we estimate it properly? Or are we actually referring to in the brain likelihoods and 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 priors and these are psychological things? And again, I'm not trying to be polemical. I, I, I can never decide which one it is. And it sounds to me that when Conrad says he's a behavioral Bayesian, he just wants it to be about the structure of the world. Yeah, and, and and I agree with that. Now, like, like let's let's look at the three levels at which we can apply Bayesian uh, Bayesian ideas. Now, like, there's the behavioral level, and there's no doubt that this is kind of like a great theory. Now, like, I can like if I put you into a uh, combination situation, I'm very likely to be good at predicting how you will combine like a noisy auditory with a noisy visual stimulus. Okay, so there, like, for a lot of phenomena in that at least somewhat goes into a more psychological domain that should make you with go walk like gushments, uh, which should make you reasonably happy. Then there's the mid level where you could say, if I look at like pure combination things, I know that my models 
need to use how certain the visual stimulus is. And therefore, the quest to how could the brain know about how uncertain the stimulus is gets to be a real quest, both on the behavioral side where I could do experiments to see if I can somehow vary aspects of the world that make you believe that you're more uncertain, even if you're not, like all kinds of things like that. And it also can guide a search for maybe how the brain gets there. And then there's the lower level, which is basically like, look, behavior, and, and, and that I strongly disagree with. The logic of that field works like that. Look at behavior. It's often roughly Bayesian. And because it's roughly Bayesian, we should basically find Bayes' rule implemented in a synapse or a neuron. And I don't think, I mean, like, and, and John and me are like of exactly that same opinion there, I think, that basically this, and, and Carl Friston like puts it to the maximum, basically, the world only works because the world wants to be what the world will be in the near future. And therefore the world like advances itself, like some free energy like idea. Like that's just an idea that is vacuous at best and misleading at worst but but i think that there's this middle level where like i think there's a very meaningful discussion to be had now like how much about neural hardware can we know if we consider uncertainty and how much can but we haven't just you know come about? written didn't you have a didn't you have a paper tell me if i'm slandering you where you basically did an imaging paper where you said the likelihood was here and the prior was there i mean that was exactly the language of your current biology paper uh, is, is that, is, is, I, I was making those kinds of statements until the mid 2000s, generally. So you actually uh, you're going to retract that paper then? Uh, I'm going to retract that view, and I have done that publicly, and I have given talks where I said I believed in the Bayesian brain hypothesis, and this is why I'm wrong. But I still believe that the Bayesian way of thinking about uncertainty and what we can know and how we have real uncertainty in the world is an important contribution to making progress about neuroscience. So, so yeah, my view is somewhere in between. And yes, I evolved it. And like, because I'm not a politician, like that shouldn't <laughs> come to my disadvantage. It's basically, that's what it means to be a scientist. You, you think deeply about things and figure out that your ideas have been wrong. And I have been wrong about that. Yes, yes, John. Thanks for like letting everyone know that very, very clearly. <laughs> Okay, so so in any case, we have a lot more questions to get through. Luciano, thanks so much for kicking this off with this great question. Do you have like, what is your view? Hold on, before you leave us, Luciano, tell us what your view is. Uh, but uh, thanks for uh, taking my question and uh, for the lively debate that ensued. <laughs> <laughs> also great. Thanks so much for joining us here. Um, uh, great. So, so there's a lot of questions that are a little closer to the tutorial. If that's fine, guys, I will briefly go through like a stack of those before we go to uh, towards more, uh, uh, back towards uh, more big picture views. So the first question is by Phoebe about, could you explain how the mixture of Gaussians help us infer causality? It, it basically, what we have here is we have a simple case where we implicitly have two models. We have either the two of them come from the same place or the two of them come from different places. And uh, we are basically doing model comparison is this model better than that model we find that imp implicitly and this all happens implicitly through the use of base rule and allows us to basically if we're far away then the effect is small if we're close by the effect is big and that's what we refer to as causal inference in that case um it's a great it's a great question and keep in mind that we have causality you know like this is this here, it, it's called causal inference because it's in a way a certain causal question that we're asking. You will become, uh, we will be much, much clearer about causality once we reach causality day, which is week three, day three. Um, uh, what's the intuition? So we have another question from Phoebe. Well, two, two like super highly rated questions within one minute. Uh, what's the intuition of using marginalization in real life research practice? Could you give us examples of using the sum and the product rules for particular research questions? Yes, if I want to fit a Bayesian model to behavior, 
which every Bayesian like ever is doing, I need to marginalize. If I don't, it's a statistical mistake and it's unclear what then those mistaken fits do. Um, in the causal inference case, we have a marginalization, which is we consider two models. Do they belong together or don't they belong together? Another example of, the, of, of marginalization, marginalization. It occurs everywhere. And I believe we will see some of that over the next two or three days. Um, here we have a question by Patricia Rubish. And I'm sorry for going through, through the questions quickly. There's a lot of questions still in that deck. And I want to give uh, as many people as possible a chance to get the answer. Is the assumption that trials are independent? A prerequisite to use the Bayesian framework, or is there a version of Bayes rule where the trials can depend on each other, e.g. for modeling information, integration over multiple trials, learning paradigms? Would you use the posterior then as a prior for the next trial, or would that already be the case where you need Markov chains models? This is fantastic that this is a question right now, because like, is if I remember that right tomorrow and the day after tomorrow will be exactly about that. And most certainly the Bayesian framework doesn't need to assume independence of trials. Is it often done? Yes, it is often done because it massively simplifies the trials. Because as soon as I allow you temporal, like, like real temporal dependencies, well, I need to model all those dependencies. And, uh, and it's non-trivial how to do that. So great questions. Here, behavioral economists repeatedly state that humans do not always behave rationally. Oh yeah, uh, like uh, uh, here comes a question that John will find interesting, i.e. how they should given their task and environment. Given this, at what level of human behavior do Bayesian assumptions break down? John, what do you think? Um, well, we discussed that, right? In other words, I, I would just like a um, some kind of meta theory to explain why sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't, right? Um, and I'm, I, you know, I can't really provide that. You know, it reminds me a little bit of sort of the criticisms of, of, of optimal feedback control and motor control, which is you've got to be extremely careful not to move the goalposts and keep changing the cost functions so eventually behavior begins to look optimal. Right. And, you know, I and I'm not a sufficiently a Bayesian to have the ingenuity, obviously, to find ways to reframe the question. So it does suddenly it looks optimal again. Right. In other words, I know that, for example, you know, when Maurice Smith did his, you know, size weight illusion work that was deposited to be anti Bayesian, there was soon, as you could imagine, a follow up work saying actually what looked like anti-Bayesian was in fact perfectly Bayesian if you reframed it. Now, it seems to me that if you're able to be that elastic and plastic with respect to reformulating the problem so it again conforms to a Bayesian view, that gets perilously close to a not very useful theory, right? So in other words, I would defer to people like Athena and to you, Conrad, to say, that it's we just have to accept that some things are not rational, uh, do, are not Bayesian, and and we know that right. There are all sorts of famous questions. Of, you know, there's the famous one about the bank teller, right? Is you know, is the bank teller, is it more likely that she's a bank teller or more likely she's a bank teller and a radical feminist? And from a Bayesian point of view, you should say she's more likely to be a bank teller. But people tend to answer she's more likely to be a bank teller and a radical feminist. It's a famous question that immediately shows people not to be Bayesian, right? So I would you know, be interested to know, is there some meta way of thinking that can tell you when you will be and when you will not be, right? I, I, I'm just not qualified to answer that question. And, and, and if I can, I mean, like we, we worked a lot on Bayesian, uh, on experiments looking if people do Bayesian things. And and there's kind of a rule that like I think people never write about it, but that is like a little bit that meta theory that you're looking for, John, which is in general, when people don't think in my kinds of experiments, if they basically they push left, right, left, right, left, right, move, 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 then they tend to be like quite Bayesian. And when they're in that situation, let me think about that. Maybe it's A or maybe it's B. 
then they're not. So, so I, I, I think that like meta theory that we are talking about may like really cut through that space that basically they, they may be like just a fast and automatic and pretty Bayesian mode of behavior. And then like a much slower, like much less Bayesian mode. But the because... irony, the irony about your, you know, the, I mean, just the, 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 this is the fundamental point, it seems at least to me that that answer you gave, which is when you start thinking you're not as Bayesian, and yet when you're more automatic and sensory motor, you are, well then how on earth can one end up with a Bayesian theory of cognition if when you start thinking you're not Bayesian? Does That gives me cognitive dissonance. So how can one have both? What, what am I missing? So, so, so I agree that we should now get people like Tom Griffith and Gershman and uh, and Josh Tenenbaum on stage to see what they say. Uh, I don't want to put words into their mouth, but like, uh, yeah, uh, I'm just, I was just reporting my own experiences. No, we, we, we've run experiment where things were very non-Bayesian. Athena. Uh, no, I think I will get back to the, I mean, my interpretation of your, uh, what you said again, is something that John is going to hate it because it's basically like going back to to just modifying your your Bayesian interpretation in order to to put under the the same umbrella again. So meaning that when uh, your subjects in your experimental setup were just quite fast and automatic, maybe they used uh, different types of priors. And uh, compared to when they were thinking, maybe their their set of priors was different, and it was more kind of a um, um, a richer prior, a more informative prior, or something like that, right? Um, and but I totally agree with um, uh, with John that as long as we just want to say that everything is Bayesian, it's just a meaningless uh, uh, a meaningless statement because we are not learning anything from that. And we do need that meta theory that would just tell us when uh, when we are under which conditions we are using. Uh, less informative or uh, or wrong priors compared to the other other conditions and i don't think we really know that right now i don't think that 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 theory really exists right cool so uh, so let's see we are running out of the hour i ran a poll let's see um people want us to like go over a little bit um I will I will wrap this up in two minutes and then we can discuss a little more afterwards. But like everyone should feel free to leave us. Like basically, if your family is waiting for dinner, <laughs> go do dinner with them. If you if if you're feeling burned out already, go go exercise or something. Like basically, <laughs> we will offer like that you can continue join us with the discussion for a while. But like. We, it's important that you don't sacrifice your NMA experience or your real life situation for like following our discussion. So, um, so let's uh, let's go uh, further through it. So, Tanya Rubinstein asked the question: Bayesian, uh, we used Bayesians to experiments with the NMA structure. So, what people might not know is that like something like NMA, it's like a lot of pieces that 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 work together. So very early on in NMA, we basically said, let's take one day and run it as soon as possible. And we basically, a whole bunch of us basically dropped all other tasks we were doing for NMA and built one day. And that happened to be base day. So we experimented quite a bit with base day. So base day is where we introduced these nano lectures where you now have like videos in the collab. So, so uh, base day kind of was an important part of us fine tuning uh, fine-tuning NMA, um, and uh, and and that experimentation is like you you don't see the experimentation that happens behind it, but like lots of things that we do at NMA is like people basically said, okay, let's try this something in this way because it's so big, we needed to test everything, and base day was basically our poor experimental animal for working on tutorial days, so. So that was uh, Tanya Rubinstein's question. Thanks for the question. Um, what else do we have? Um, so Ami Reza Farbach is asking, does Bayesian work only for generative models? How does time fit into Bayesian stuff? We get multiple versions of this question. We will get through that in the next um, 
in the next uh, in the next two days. So so uh, don't worry, your question will get answered. Um, uh, Tara says we should take the questions about projects and mentors. Now let's see, um, Tara, do you want to come on stage to help us answer this question? Um, so 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 let's see what we what we can say. So there's some feedback that we're getting from mentors. You don't have enough time with the mentors. I agree. Um, the neo match would be a better experience if every project and every person could spend more time with their mentors. But the world only gives us a certain number of mentors. Not like it's kind of a <laughs> fixed constraint. We ask people, every, in fact, we asked everyone we knew basically, hey, can you volunteer some hours to mentor students? And it would have been nice if we had more of these hours, but like, hey, it's COVID-19. A lot of people are struggling even with just supervising their own lab. So I think uh, people's hands are tight. Now, Athena, do you, do you share my view of that? Yeah, totally. As a as a person who was in charge of uh, uh, kind of coordinating mentors and projects, I closely uh, uh, witnessed that. I mean, uh, there are people that really, really struggle to fit in uh, a couple of hours to help, and and uh, but this is the best we could do. And I'm very actually grateful to all these mentors that volunteer their daytime in spite of. Uh, a lot of other problems that yeah, exist around us during the pandemic. And um, the thing is that uh, they will be with you, those who can spend more than half an hour. I am sure that they will do that uh, as much as they can. Uh, try to be f flexible around your mentors. You can communicate with them, see if some other timing would work with them. But if it doesn't, uh, that's fine. The important thing is for you guys to practice brainstorming together, think about the uh, um, uh, different steps of the of the project. And um, I think still four times of, of, of mentoring sessions probably is enough for you to check on you and make sure that you are on the right track. And the rest is basically on you in order to coordinate with your uh, collaborators, with your uh, group uh, members, and uh, um, have fun. The, the most important thing about project time is just like try to have fun and 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 uh, communicate with each other, brainstorm with each other. Yeah, and in, in your group, and what I often find is that at these summer schools, these groups really push one another forward because like, Hey, in your group, it's a bunch. You're already a bunch of scientists. You can totally give one another like feedback on, on, on if you feel you're being similar. Like and I should add one more thing. There was also a question about the matching of the mentors to the teams. Like, yes, in an ideal world, if we had unlimited time, we would like optimize which exact mentor gets to be matched with exactly which team. But we only have so many mentors, so it's not that we can like arbitrarily get the right people. And the other one is also, we only had so much time for like optimizing how we do this. So we're kind of working under the constraints that we're living in and there's little to do. John, do you want to do a few extra hours of, men uh, of mentorship for your man? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I was thinking of shrinking myself down so I wouldn't be... We can take this offline. I, I, I don't think that yeah, I, I, can, will, uh, I can again tell you that oh, the whole weekend, the whole matching uh, team was working almost 24 hours uh, to, to get these, these matchings. We know that they are not ideal as, as, as Conrad said, because maybe the, 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 the uh, mentor's expertise doesn't exactly match the, the project topic, but that's not the point, right? You should, you should get some other type of feedback uh, and comments out of the mentor, not necessarily about technical aspects of the, of the project. You need to, they, they need to give you quest uh, a feedback about high level aspect of thinking in a scientific way. And I am sure that all of them will be able to help you in that regard. And, 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 and a lot of what makes good projects is at some level that they like pass the high level. Is this logic? -y? Does it make sense for me? And, and John is a good friend of mine. And I often like talk with him and like run like he's a project. What do you think? And John's in a very different area, like much more clinical, with 
very different set of ways of thinking about things. And it always helps me tremendously to, to get feedback from people that I'm not doing exactly the same thing. And if someone knows the data set, that kind of makes them suspicious. And you know, like, uh, if someone already knows the data set that you're, that you're working on, uh, they they will not understand that there's like questions that need to be explained or like it's, it's unclear what the right question is and so forth. So okay, I think it's a, it, it's a good chance for those who have a mentor conflict if you're from another another uh, expertise because they really would, would challenge you. Why, why does this? Why, why do we care about this question? Why does it help us of, 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 of knowing about the brain? And, right. Um, uh, okay, cool. So so it looks like John left us. <laughs> I was maybe a little unfriendly asking him if he wants to help us mentor. Uh, but uh, uh, but why don't we, uh, like, like what I'm planning to do now is I'm going to take like a bunch of the questions in sequence. And once we hit 10.15, um, uh, we will basically, we will break that. And let's see how many questions we get. So, the first one is the free energy principle seems to be avoided in discussions about the Bayesian brain. Why? Uh, well, the Bayesians uh, don't consider free energy to be overly interesting. Free energy is one of the approximate algorithms that we use for solving Bayesian integrals. Uh, for some cases, it's good. For others, it's not so good. And the person who calls it free energy principle is only Carl Freston, who doesn't seem to be overly attuned with, with say, the development of technical uh, approaches in uh, in Bayesian statistics. That's why Bayesians don't usually talk about it, in my view. Um, let's see. Is the Bayesian assumption that the brain is near optimal given certain constraints valid for the non ethological paradigms tested in the lab, where evolution cannot be used as an argument for, uh, for, for optimality? What do you think, Athena? Ah, uh, I think I still need to. I lost your voice. Okay, cool. I, I lost your sound again. Sorry. Uh, great. Can you oh, see you if I can come can back. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I think I can't hear me. So, so I will ask the question, uh, answer the question then instead. Um, um, evolution can't be used for uh, for that reason, but learning can be used. Now, you can say evolution might have given us a learning algorithm that is of the nature that it can learn to be Bayesian. And now typically in those experiments, we massively overtrained our people. And that's why they often look like they're really optimal for the specific task that we give them in the in the lab. So yes, evolution can be used, but arguably the massive overtraining can be used. In that context, I want to mention one thing. Uh, there's a great paper by Conlin Way that I was involved with uh, that asks to which level uh, the uh, using computers change the, changes the way you do sensor and motor integration, it has a very strong effect. So, so basically, the long-term history has a very clear effect. Um, so, Athena, you just missed one question. Um, uh, can you hear me again? Yeah, I do hear you now. OK, great, great. Uh, cool. So, so here we have a question by Kishore Kumar Jagini. And I apologize, uh, there was a few people whose name I forgot to, to list, but uh, I was trying to get through it uh, quickly here, and I apologize. Uh, when we are not expected to use Bayesian inference, uh, when we are not expected to use Bayesian inference with Gaussian assumptions, how does Bayesian causal inference and Q-integration work in the case of trimodal sensory conditions? Um, there's some great work by Lan and Shams who experimentally asked all those questions. Um, uh, the, uh, suddenly the trimodal one, uh, where you say hear, feel, and see things. Um, and she's been working explicitly on causal inferences there. Um, involved theory, so I don't want to get uh, get overly into it. But like, yes, it's a beautiful area of the field. Um, cool. What are the implications of the limited precision to represent probability distributions, as well as perceptual distortions and stimulus representations, e.g. Weber, Weber's law for Bayesian computations in the brain? Athena, do you want to take this one? Um, okay, cool. Yeah, sure. I mean, okay. Um, so I'm not sure whether I understand this question uh, quite well. Um, 
so definitely at the level of behavior we can still as uh, like we can we can say uh, uh, we can kind of look whether Weber law holds or it doesn't hold and most of the cases it holds um, and then we can uh, we can have ways to either like I mean, if you change the, the scale of, of sensory uh, measurements from linear to log, then, then things would hold again linearly in, the, in, that, in that log space, right? And then, so maybe then, then once you, you uh, uh, do that transformation, then you can apply the, the uh, um, uh, uh, probabilistic uh, reasoning in, the, in that, in, in, the, in the transform uh, um, uh, space that, that linearity um, holds. Uh, so, but if you mean that, like, um, at the level of neurons, precision changes depending on which type of sensory stimuli and which type of, um, um, which range of stimuli we use, um, and whether, and depending that, like, depending on that precision, we can use base or not, I think they can be independent from each other. So, might have a, a, a noisier representation uh, in some conditions, uh, but still, the same type of com uh, computation can can hold, uh, even if, the, if if the representation is noisier and less precise. If I understood the question right, I'm right. not sure. No, and for Bayesian computation, no, like if we want the brain to be able to do Bayesian computations, it needs to effectively know Weber's law, and it very much looks like it does. There's a whole bunch of papers that show yeah. that there's a lot of phenomena that can be understood by assuming that the brain knows how sigma depends on the signals. A great question. Um, here, how to understand prior as causal inference in today's tutorial. So the prior is the sum of what happens out of two different models. Now, effectively, so the causal inference happens implicitly that effectively so so you could write the same math in two ways i can either calculate how probable it is that it's common or not common and then produce the optimal estimate based on that in this case we went directly to calculate the optimal estimate but the results are exactly the same and that's why we use the causal inference moniker um here uh, here we have a question by clara Cooper, we uh, calculated the prior under the assumption of common sources of vision auditor input and under the assumption on independent sources. If the sources are independent, why is the prior still modeled as a Gaussian distribution with the same mean as in the dependent case? Shouldn't we model it with the uniform distribution since every position is equally likely? Yes, um, we are using a super, super broad Gaussian, which is effectively the same thing. You could still say that the independent uh, condition assumes that there's like some weak notion that you expect it in the similar range. For the specific situation, those predictions will almost be the same between those two models. But it's a great question. Um, here, we have a question by Robin Eckland. Is the Bayesian theory of the brain compatible with local learning rules or would global rules be required? Um, there exist theories that say that there exist conditions where global rules are not required. Um, in fact, there are there's research that suggests that uh, backpropagation of error is can be done with using local only rules. So, the bridge between those two is a little unclear. Do you want to add something to that thing? I mean, just saying that, like, I mean, as we were talking so far, when when we talk about Bayesian behavior that's at the level of behavior, that's at the level of computation, right? And then it's a really far away uh, from where we get to the implementation and how that, that, that uh, what is the, the, the algorithm, what, what is the algorithm, what is the implementation in the brain? And a lot of times we do, as you mentioned, uh, Conrad, earlier, uh, uh, things inside the brain, they are not working based on the uh, multiplication of of a prior and the likelihood to get the posterior. They might be completely non-Bayesian, but at the level of behavior, you might get Bayesian behavior. So it really depends how you're implementing these, these Bayesian uh, computation in the brain. Then we can talk about the learning rule and what, right. what are the learning rules that are used. Cool, so we should we should wrap up. So, so I, wanna, I want to make one thing clear here. 
what I thought was so important, and that's why I was so delighted that John was joining us here, is that we are still thinking about what exactly we want to do with the Bayesian or the Y models in general. And like, Y models on topic. How do, where does that lead us? I want to emphasize that there's a symmetry. And like the same thing is, of course, true for the what models just as well. And like, we don't know exactly how we should interpret them. What does it mean? How, like, what does it mean to falsify a what model? And like, sure, like John points out that all the Bayesian models aren't quite right. And in particular, if it comes to high level cognition, they, they aren't right. But if I look at high level cognition and I ask you, how do neurons do that? I mean, like, you'll be in trouble, <laughs> just to be clear. So, so these like underlying conceptual problems exist in every branch of neuroscience. And every field tends to like put them under the carpet so that you don't see it, which is bad because it means that if you start in a field, it will kind of take you until you're really grappling with those questions, until you even realize that there are questions. It's like, it feels everything is clear. Everything is like, you just do the same kinds of experiments that someone else does. But like, no, like the real revolutions come from like re a rethinking of what the bases are that we're building things. And in that sense, like uh, like having the discussion with Athena and John and me, that we and with all three of us coming from very different angles, I thought that was very important that you, that you just see that. And with that, I just want to thank everyone for joining. I want to thank Athena and John for joining us on stage. I want to thank the students and participants who came on stage for participating. And I want to thank all of you for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone.